everyone. Thank you so much for joining me on the Hope for Today broadcast. I'm your host, Doran Wengard, founder of Wengard Ministries, where we are delivering hope to every heart. I want to tell you, I am so excited about these messages and of all the wonderful things that God has been doing in people's lives through listening to them. If you have a testimony or a story of how God has touched you through these, please text the word STORY to our ministry line, 844 844- 333-7227. And also, if you'd like to partner with us, please text the word GIVE to that same number. I want to say thank you to all of our partners and friends who have joined with us, sowed seed in the good soil, and, and are seeing the Word of God being spread around the world. We have people downloading these messages from all over the place. So it, it is exciting to see. Now today, I want to talk about something that comes dear to my heart because I have some close friends, and and this message comes from a conversation that I had with them. I know that many times we can wonder if God is hearing all of our prayers, but then we see him move again in our life or in someone else's life, or we read again of stories in the Word, and and we realize how much we actually mean to the Lord. Now, I just talked with my friends, and and they're, they're coming through a physical trial, this is a husband and wife who are just now learning about the goodness of God and the completeness of the finished work of Jesus. Now, they didn't really need to know before because things were going fairly smoothly for them. I actually think most Christians could put themselves in this category for one reason or another. People have not had to exercise their faith and as a result have never developed the ability to find the answers when they need them. And this is especially in, in free countries where we have the ability to dig into the Word of God or not. We're not actively persecuted like in some places. And when that happens, um, apathy tends to, to set in. And so people have not exercised their faith. Well, today I'd like to talk to you about something that the Lord spoke to me through some wonderful teachers of the Word. And I've titled the message today, Prayers with Answers. Isn't that what we want? We have prayers and we want to know that we can get answers. But have you ever just asked for a bunch of random things from God, just wishing that some of them would hit the mark or just get answered? Well, I want to show you today that you can pray in a way that is targeted and effective. There are some specific things to keep in mind that will help your prayers to produce results. When I was growing up, I was told that God always answers your prayers, but his answers can be different every time. I was taught that sometimes he answers yes, sometimes he says no, and sometimes he says wait a while. Now those ideas are nothing more than religious garbage. There's no foundation in the word of God for those. We've been taught that by tradition and really by people who, people have believed in it because they lack the knowledge of the Word of God. Nowhere in the Gospels did Jesus actually teach that God sometimes says no to us when we pray. Not one time did he ever say, did he, did he ever tell a praying person they had to wait a while to receive from God? People have only taught this to others because they couldn't figure out why their own prayers were not producing the desired results. But it doesn't line up with the Word of God. So in in John 16, 23 and 24, it says, In that day you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. In Matthew 21, 22, it says, Whatever things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. And then obviously Mark eleven twenty two 22 through 24 says, uh, Jesus said to them, Have faith in God or have the faith of God. For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. John 15, 7 says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall 
be done for you. Now, this la- the last verse I just read, do you realize the word you is mentioned five times in, that, in the last verse? If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. This, to show, this shows me that getting our prayers answered is more up to us than it is up to God. He's not holding out on us. It is his will to do for us exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ask or think. That's what it says in Ephesians 3.20. God's will for us is that we will renew our minds to his word and that we will believe and that we will receive. Receiving from God is not as complicated as, as we have made it. It's not a complicated process, but it does require focus and diligence and an understanding of the word. If we want to pray like Jesus taught us, we can't just pull a random verse out of the promise box and then fire it off to heaven for the answer to rain down on us. Our entire existence in the kingdom of God is about relationship with the king. See, we were created for true and lasting relationship. When you've spent some serious time in the Bible and in fellowship with your heavenly father, you will be able to discern exactly what you want to receive from him. He wants us to prioritize and to be specific. Take the time to envision yourself receiving something very specific and then allow him to change your desires to fit his perfect will for you. So much of the teaching that I heard growing up was was about a father who really loved his children but was aloof from them and would just say no to their requests without explanation. And they would say, well, you just never can tell. You don't know what God's doing. And that's not true. That's not what the word says. It's opposite from the Father that we see modeled in Jesus or even from the writers of the New Testament. What the traditional view was missing was the fact that our desire automatically aligns with the Heavenly Father when we have spent time with him and when we've been renewing our minds in his living word. See, this lines us up with him and allows our desires to be completely in line with him. Much of this revelation I've gotten comes from mature teachers of the word. They've been learning and experiencing this for years. Brother Kenneth Copeland says, God didn't ask you to pay for it. He asked you to pray for it. Believe and you have received it. When, you can th- when, when all you can think is how much it costs, you'll never be able to hope and truly see yourself receiving what you're asking for. Andrew Womack says, when it's God's will, then it's God's bill. He also says, when God gives a vision, he also gives the provision. Trust him to do what he said he will do. Too many times our logic gets in the way of our faith, and we reason ourselves away from the answer before we ever even ask for it. When a child spends time with his or her earthly father or someone else that they really look up to and respect, that child will automatically desire the things that they think will please the one that they honor. This is exactly the process that takes place when we, as children of God, have spent much time with him, our Heavenly Father. We've given so much effort trying to get God to do something, but so little effort is put toward actually getting to know him. In Psalm 37, 4, it says, Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Now, doesn't that sound wonderful? Doesn't that sound so much better than the religious idea of God's just going to hold out on you until eh, sometime when he decides? He, it is his great pleasure and desire to give you the things that you desire. Now, I've seen this both as God giving us what we desire, but even more importantly, I believe he gives us the very desires which line up for his heart. So that verse, I I believe, has a double meaning. Not only does he give us the things that we desire, but he also gives us the desire for them, which are proper and, and aligned with his word. So if you delight yourself in the Lord, and the desire that you have comes directly from him, why in the world would he tell you no when you ask for it? 
Obviously, this is why our relationship with our Heavenly Father is so much more than just a, a heavenly vending machine or slot machine or something that just spits out answers when, when we get the combination right or we add the right amount of payment. That's not what he is. That's not how he operates. James uh, addresses the problem of prayers not being answered in James 4.3. He says, You ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Now, did he say that we do not receive because God just decided to say no? He didn't say that. That's not it at all. He says that you haven't received because you are asking with selfish motives. Now, some people have used this to say that we should never ask for big and expensive things, but that has nothing to do with it. There's no qualification in what he's saying other than that you may spend it on your pleasures. So when our hearts are not in, aligned, in alignment with the, the king, our own pleasure becomes the source of our desires. And when that happens, we are misaligned. We are not in alignment with him. And so our prayers are not being answered because it's just about spending them on our pleasures. But it has nothing to do with the size of the blessing at all. When you've spent time with your Heavenly Father, you will see very clearly that he really likes nice things. Just look at how he blessed the faithful man in the Old Testament. And you can see easily that he delights in big and expensive blessings. I could, I could name a list of all of these men of God that saw amazing blessings because they were in alignment with him. Remember, it can never be only about the thing itself or you've begun to miss out on your relationship with him. So if the focus is, God, that's too big, you'll miss out on your relationship with him. In their attempt to not ask amiss, though, people have been very ambiguous with their requests. This is a big mistake when desiring to see our prayers answered and to see them be effective. Bill Winston tells of a time when he and his wife Veronica did this years ago, when he was just starting seminary at Oral Roberts University. With him going to school, they needed Veronica to get a job to help pay for their living expenses. They sought God's wisdom and spent time in his presence. They made a list of exactly the job they wanted for her, and then they wrote it down on a card. The kind of work, the salary, the location, the car that she needed to get there, all of the details that they, that they could um, see in this process. Then they prayed about it. They believed they had received, and afterward, if someone would ask Bill, has Veronica got her job yet? Bill would say, yep. If they'd ask where she was working, he'd say, well, we don't know yet, but she has the job. Sure enough, she got exactly the job they had requested. It matched everything they had written on the card, and God provided it for them right in the middle of a recession. Sometimes we ask, you know, trying to see just what we will see with our own heart instead of going to the Lord and dreaming with him. When you are seeking God about your request, he may show you something different, something that surprises you. If you allow yourself simply to be at rest in his presence, he may take your prayer in an entirely different direction. But that again is how he aligns your desires with his. About 15 years ago or so, I had reached a point that I felt like none of my prayers were being answered. I continued asking God about it. And he answered in a message that I heard preached in church. The preacher said, if your prayers aren't being answered, go back and do the last thing that God has asked you to do. Now, I was not expecting what happened next. Immediately, God spoke directly to my heart and reminded me that he had clearly told me to learn Spanish. I had actually bought a Spanish learning program back then when he told me but it had sat on my shelf for four years. So what in the world does learning Spanish have to do with getting my prayers answered? It's a simple fact that I was living in disobedience because I was unwilling to commit to the time required to learning a new language. Now I committed to 15 minutes a day, at least five days a week. 
and immediately my prayers began, began to be answered. I hadn't even completed the program. I just simply committed and began, and my heart went into obedience, and my prayers began to be answered. Do you understand this? That it wasn't God at all who was keeping my answers from me. It was me. I was the, the, the holdup. I was the, the blockage. Now, a little while ago, I heard Robbie Dawkins preach in person, and he said something that I'll never forget. He said, obedience is success, not results. And I realized right there that my constant focus on the results would never reveal whether I was truly successful or not. Simple obedience is already walking in success, regardless of what results that brings. That was freeing for me to hear that. I didn't, did not know why God had asked me to study Spanish, and I still don't, but I am perfectly clear with the fact that my relationship with him is deep and strong because I was simply obedient to his word. Another thing to remember is that we, we find scriptures that promise what we're looking for. Look for them. Dig in the word. Don't just blurt out a couple familiar verses and then expect that to produce the results you're looking for. Ask the Lord for a word. Go to the, to the word of God, the written word. Be deliberate. Be specific. Take the time. Build a scriptural foundation for your prayer. Open your Bible. Locate the verses or promises that fit. Then you can write them down. Solidify them in your own heart. Once again, I want to remind you that this isn't performance or manipulation that we're talking about. This is about getting the Word of God deep into your heart where it begins to change your desires to come into alignment with Him. In Joshua 1.8, it says very clearly, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do all the, all the according that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Now, I know we've talked about this before, but remember, Jesus fulfilled all the law and he gave us the credit for it. Our focus in this verse is, is not the law anymore. This is Joshua and he's talking about the law, but rather on meditation. He says, you shall meditate in it day and night. If you meditate in the word of God, I promise you, you will begin to see results and answers to your prayers. Also, did you notice who it was that would make, make the way prosperous for Joshua? Now, this was the Spirit of the Lord talking to Joshua, and he says, you will make your way prosperous. See, it was up to Joshua. It was up to the focus of his heart. This was not God deciding whether or not Joshua would be successful. He had already given him everything he needed to be successful. Since the beginning of time, God has been showing his people how to be successful in his kingdom, and he has set us up for this. We have an entire book full of promises that we can be meditating on. And we've been told very clearly that God's answer is always yes. I want to read 2 Corinthians uh, 1, verses 18 through 20. It says, But as God is faithful... Our word to you was not yes and no, for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me, Sylvanus and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him was yes, for all the promises of God in him are yes and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. Well, that's very clear. All of the promises of God are yes and in him, amen. Praise God that we can rely on him to be faithful 100% of the time. When you take the time to press into your relationship with your Heavenly Father, you will find his word come alive to you, come alive in your heart as well. I, I'd like to talk about how these things go hand in hand. They're not a formula. They're not a, a special combination for answers. It's relationship, 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 relationship. God created mankind for the sole purpose of being a good father to his children. He wanted, he wanted to love us and then to watch us grow, all the while becoming intimate and personal with each one of us individually. 
The specific desires that he gives you and the verses that he wants you to meditate on are different than the combination of desires and word that he has specifically given to me. You cannot live out of my relationship with God or out of anyone else's relationship with God. Not your parents, not your friends. This is a one-on-one connection between God and each individual man or woman on the planet. We can definitely learn from each other. But you need to take the time and focus on growing in your relationship with God. There is a place of rest when we, get, when, when we begin to walk in step with Him. And all the promises of God become yes and amen because we come in step with Him. It becomes in rhythm with Him. Now I want to finish up here with some favorite verses of mine that talk about being continually connected with God and allowing the finished work of Jesus to faithfully produce results in your life. I want to look at Matthew 7, uh, verses 7 through 11. This is Jesus talking. And he says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? What a promise that is. He's saying, I'm a good father. Why would I give you something that is bad for you? Why would I give you something that is against what you desire? I want to give you what you want. True success is our obedience to God and his word, when the principles of the kingdom of God can freely produce the results of his blessing and favor in our lives. That's also success for God as our Father. He wants to see the blessings of God come alive in our lives. He wants to see them become a reality to us. Now, instead of arguing with these truths, I want to encourage you to try something different. If you haven't seen this happen in your life, that doesn't mean that it's not God's will. It just means you haven't seen it. Try trusting God and his word, regardless of the results that you see to begin with. True faith needs to be grown and developed and matured. The years of unbelief that you've agreed with and have been taught must be countered with a faith that says, I choose to believe the word of God, no matter what my circumstances try to tell me. And then we can be an example of his goodness to those around us. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. God bless you.